Okay, I know it's called The Devil Made Me Do It because of the actual case it's based on, but there's just something so funny about The Conjuring 3. The Devil Made Me Do It. Also, apologies if uh, the audio is kind of bad today. Everybody is doing uh, like yard work and playing basketball because it's a beautiful day and I'm here. So movie universes seem to be getting more and more popular every single year. There's the obvious, like the Marvel Cinematic Universe, the more subtle ones, like the interconnection of a bunch of different Tarantino movies, and then the ones that uh, completely failed to even get off the ground. What the but in the world of horror, one cinematic universe seems to reign supreme, the Conjuring universe. Loosely based on the real life cases conducted by Ed and Lorraine Warren, The Conjuring focuses on a haunted doll named Annabelle, which sparked a series of spinoffs around this demonic Thing. But before we get into demons hiding around every corner, let's get into what's hiding behind this Star Wars poster. Oh my God, it's today's sponsor, Haritos. Look, I'm working with a demonic possession movie here. Bear with me. Haritos doesn't just come in a glass bottle. It comes in a variety of fun, natural flavors, and it's made with real sugar. Things like fruit punch, mango, mandarin, and guava are just a fraction of the many exciting flavors that you can expect. And right now they have mood packs available that come in 12 different flavors, including the elusive watermelon. So if you want to try Haritos out for yourself, click the link down below to find these store locator so you can figure out where they're selling that mood pack and a bunch of the other fun and exciting flavors near you. Back to the demons. Now the Conjuring movies themselves are built as based on a true story and the promotion is really gonna push that fact. And the movies themselves are really gonna try to push that fact. But inspired by real events would probably be the better terminology for these movies because they go so far off the deep end of stories that are already very shrouded in skepticism. There are absolutely exaggerated aspects to every single one of these movies and the claims made by the Warrens have been called into question on numerous occasions. There's also a really big $900 million legal dispute that popped up from Gerard Brittle who had exclusive rights to tell the stories of the Warrens. Predatory allegations against Ed Warren in regards to a long-term affair he allegedly had. But other than that last one, obviously, it makes for good stories. A lot of the things that happen in this world may seem too unusual or weird to have any logical explanation, and stuff like this offers up that alternative option. Most famously, the Warrens are known for their involvement in the Amityville horror case, which is something that would require an entire video in its own right to explain the many layers of intricacies going on there. Whatever you believe, I just really like this clip where the Warrens are talking about their evidence of the supernatural, and she's like, hey, see, look, this is a photograph of an obvious demon and it's like the camera's an impartial witness. This is the truth. Mm -hmm. How do you obtain these pictures? Do you actually take them yourself? Oh, or? no, no. Most oh, of no. them have been brought to us for research. But when it comes to the movies based on the cases covered by the Warrens, the first Conjuring movie definitely stands out as a genuine highlight. Really effective horror, even if it is in the often criticized jump scare genre of horror, but overall, it's just a really well-crafted movie and it's effective as a horror film. But The Conjuring 3? Maybe not so much. Like with the previous Conjuring movies, this is based on a real story, which we will go over soon, but just know that the real boy involved in the beginning of this movie is Exorcism, David Glatzel, and his brother Carl Glatzel sued Gerard Brittle, the aforementioned author, and the Warrens based on the information in a novel they wrote on the grounds of lying, violation of privacy, and causing intentional emotional distress. And while the case was dismissed and Brittle obviously countered their claims, he did end up pulling the book from print though for whatever reason it is available as an audiobook right now. Either way, this movie largely focuses on Arnie Johnson. That's a lie, this movie largely focuses on the Warren, but it's around the Arnie Johnson case. And Arnie Johnson is someone who murdered his landlord and then tried to use the defense of demonic possession to at least alleviate some of his culpability to the crime. And he made these claims because he was present for a number of demonic instances and an exorcism that was conducted on his girlfriend's younger brother, David. The Warrens were involved in these exorcisms and claimed that David was possessed by 43 demons and two devils. Intense. Now, following an exorcism where Arnie was allegedly talking directly to the demon and in some accounts saying that he actually asked it to take him instead, rather than it bopping back down to hell, it just body hopped over to him. But this is where the movie takes a number of creative liberties as you would expect it to, but for the amount of times it says based on a true story, I, yeah. But Ed ends up having a heart attack, they weave in a side story about a curse, witches' totems, and a fake possession story that resulted in murder. Well, there's some really cool lore built in and the premise itself is quite sinister. The movie itself is just really lackluster. There's a really interesting thread with the detective in another city and I personally really enjoy this like detective paranormal investigator crossover more so than what we actually got. Like give me something with the vibe of prisoners but with a supernatural aspect. I think 
think that's basically like the comic book series nail biter, but I wanted a movie. So let's get into the movie. And as we weave through the story, I'll take little detours to give you actual information on the real case and where the movie differed from it, how it changed from the official records. But keep in mind that most of this is just like really shallow court document stuff. And then just firsthand accounts from people who had quite a bit to gain from this being demonic possession. So The Conjuring kicks us right into it at the Glatzel home, largely destroyed, scratches on the wall, and then we get a screen title card that lets us know that on July 18th, 1981, Ed and Lorraine Warren were called to document the exorcism of eight-year-old David Glatzel. Now already the dates there are wrong, so we'll just keep going. But while waiting for the priest to arrive, a demon takes over David and has him charge at his own father with a piece of a broken mirror. So they instantly start doing the exorcism. You get the full body contortions. And I always find it interesting that people in these movies always just seem fine after a body has turned them into a living pretzel. Like they literally look like they walked out of that weird Twizzlers commercial. Like at least in Supernatural, if something horrible happens to your body when a demon inhabits it, when the demon leaves, like you die. Not that I want people to die. I'm just saying the logic follows through better. But I guess this scene was actually done practically with like a little girl, so I, what do I know? <laughs> While the exorcism is happening, Lorraine ends up having a vision of some ritualistic stuff happening before Ed has a heart attack. And since he was the only one who saw the demon enter Arnie after he was like, take me instead, uh, no one knows. But like, why didn't Arnie say something happened? He just invited it in and felt it happen. <laughs> See, in real life, they just didn't know that the demon hopped over into Arnie's body. It's probably because it didn't. I, stuck your heart, old man. I also find it fun that they have someone filming them and then they actually like show the footage through the camera as if this footage actually exists somewhere, but it doesn't. There are some pictures of David around the exorcisms, but I'm not gonna show them here because for one, they don't prove anything. And two, if uh, he wasn't actually possessed by a demon, that's questionable stuff. But after this, we get like the rolling title scene that makes it feel more like a documentary that ends with based on a true story. Yeah, but no. Anyways, Arnie obviously starts showing all the telltale signs of possession. He's seeing things, he's being tormented by a mysterious being, he's having visions and hallucinations, he's messing with stereos as he's walking by them, dropping a chainsaw. It's important to note that in the real story, even though Debbie Glatzel, his girlfriend, noted five instances and signs of demonic possession, he never had any of these things show up at work and no one else noticed anything. But movie Arnie obviously isn't feeling so hot. I mean, he dropped a chainsaw. So he ends up leaving work early and Bruno, their landlord, takes us as a sign to party. So Bruno is Alan Bono or the victim. And I'm guessing they didn't want to use his actual name in this movie out of respect or they just weren't allowed to, but this is who he's going to kill. Before all that, we get a backstory to how the lovely Warren couple came to meet. Lorraine went to the movies one day. Ed was the usher. They had their first date that night and then got caught in the rain underneath the gazebo. Where are the demons? But Ed finally wakes up from the heart attack and he's instantly freaking out about needing to warn the Glatzels about Arnie. Again, never happened. It seems like Arnie managed to fix the stereo. I really thought that was like demonic intervention. Call the emergency vet. I wrote the number now, they stuck it on your fridge. But either way, Bono is blaring it so loud that they don't hear the phone ringing when Lorraine's calling to try to warn them. Again, this never happened. I think in real life, the most Lorraine did was like in October, she warned police that whatever was going on with David would end violently, but... Yeah. And then Bruno starts forcing Debbie to dance with him, which is annoying, but Arnie starts seeing it as something very different. He thinks that Debbie is begging for his help and that Bruno is morphing into some kind of demon, so he stabs him repeatedly. It then cuts to this admittedly really well executed scene from the trailer where Arnie's just walking down the street in a daze with like the demon eyes before police stop him. I think I hurt someone. Now these events played out differently in real life. Arnie did call in sick, but when he went back to the kennel where Debbie worked, his sisters, Wanda and Janice, and Debbie's nine-year-old cousin were also there. Bono, Debbie's boss, brought the group up for lunch and then got super drunk, and Arnie did end up fixing the stereo, which he did blast like uncomfortably high levels, and then brought them upstairs to his apartment to watch TV, where he again was blasting it super loud. I guess at some point he started acting unusually, so Debbie tried getting everyone downstairs, which is when he grabbed Mary. This is when Arnie came in and started arguing with Bono, reportedly started 
started growling at him before he stabbed him multiple times. So you be the judge, agitated freak out because a 40 year old grabbed a nine year old girl or demonic possession. However, unlike in the movie where this is basically like an instant turnaround of like transfer in possession to tragic killing within a few days, Arnie wouldn't kill his landlord until several months after the Warrens involvement with David's exorcism. Now in both the movie and reality, Arnie was obviously arrested and the defense starts working on their the devil made me do it defense after Lorraine Warner called the day after the murder to claim that Arnie was the victim of demonic possession. The judge said no, but the movie obviously has to operate under the delusion that the Warrens were going to prove demonic possession to save Arnie from the death sentence. So it cuts to them in prison surrounding Arnie with holy items, having him read from the Bible and nothing happens, which means he's not possessed now, but he might've been possessed before. The devil's doing part-time shifts, I guess. So they head back to the glass on the host to see if they can find any evidence of demonic possession and they see some on the floor under the waterbed, which leads them under the house where they find this creepy thing, which is revealed to be a witch's totem. So someone actively cursed David and then it got passed on to Arnie. While over-dramatized, the thing with the waterbed did actually happen a little bit, except David just felt like somebody pushed him down onto the bed and then he saw that plaid shirted man. Right, that's the demon he's dealing with right now. It was a plaid shirted man and then I think eventually it changed to a plaid shirted man with jeans, but then like hooves for feet. So they're trying to figure out exactly what happened with this totem. So Father Gordon tells them they should hit up another priest that helped expose the disciples of the Ram. Yes, from the Annabelle movies. So they head off to find this renowned occultist. I have chicken shit on my hands. Ah yes, this man will be of supreme assistance. So the former Father Kastner has retired from the church and redirected his life to learning about the occult and to help those that seek to curse others and figure out why they did it. But he sees this totem and he's instantly like, forget you ever saw this. So that's helpful, but they obviously want to know why somebody would want to curse a little kid, but there is no why. Satanists only aim is chaos and despair. I don't know, I think there's better ways to spend a Friday night, but who am I to judge? He takes him down to his basement and Lorraine instantly gets a bad feeling and doesn't want to go down, but it's because he has a creeper museum too. He's got all these different totems and books and Lorraine doesn't want Ed to touch any of it and very hypocritically claims that he should be burning all of this stuff. Um, are you guys forgetting your museum of haunted items? But he ends up telling a story of local Satanists who were charged and convicted. And then the lead prosecutor's life essentially started to fall apart. His child was born early with its heart outside of his body, his wife committed suicide, though I might have chalked that up to the horrible death of their child. But he's basically saying that the Warrens better be prepared to lose everything if they want to save Arnie. Which means it's time to check in with him and surprise the demons back because someone was doing some Satan shit. But the Warrens catch a bit of a break. They send pictures of the totem out to various departments to see if anyone else has come across something similar. And sure enough, they get a bite from Massachusetts. So a homicide detective fills them in on these two best friends. And they were roommates. God, they were roommates. Jessica and Katie that also went missing. And then Katie was found stabbed 22 times and they never found Jessica, but they did find one of these weird totems in her room. So the detective obviously doesn't believe in the supernatural side of things, but agrees to share information with them if they can help find Jessica or find out what happened. I also just find it really funny that the detective's like, look, we've poured over these case files so many times. I don't think there's anything you can see in there that we didn't. And Lorraine's like, oh no, no. Like I can see things that other people can't and especially not your people. Just please give me access to your classified secret documents. So he at least agrees to take them out to where they found the body. Elvis starts playing on the radio because of course, and Lorraine says that she had met him at one point. Was that before or after he died? Before and after. So when they get to the spot it happened, Lorraine has a vision back to the night it happened. And it's Jessica and Katie running, having a great night. And then Jessica giving Katie a bracelet she found at a festival. Will you help me put it on? Best friends, my ass. But then it cuts to Jessica possessed, brutally stabbing Katie before she presumably ran off a cliff. Now I would personally like the demonological explanation as to how a demon hand grabbed Lorraine Warren to try to pull her over the side. <laughs> But whatever, there's actually an entire comic book being published by DC right now called The Conjuring the Lover that's basically a prequel to the movie. At the time of recording, there's only one issue out, but it seems interesting so far, but it's called The Lover, not The Best Friend, so I'm not making things up in my head. We're gonna get to a point later on where I feel like people are being purposely stupid, but 
for just know that I'm vindicated based on the comic book title. Like the second I saw the picture of them together, I knew. But their info was good. After dragging the lake, they end up finding Jessica's body, even though they'd already done that twice. So the detective is willing to let them see the case files. Now I don't actually think they find anything from the case files that was useful, but <laughs> they had a fun little detour. But they need all the information they can get, because at this point, the demon is now telling Arnie to kill himself. So they tell Debbie to get the prison priest to put him under 24 hour watch before the phone just completely screeches out. Meaning somehow demonic interference has transferred into the phone lines when none of these people are possessed. But the message gets passed along and the good father leaves him with a glass bottle of holy water because that's exactly what you want to give somebody who's possessed by a suicide demon glass. But they realize that if it's a curse, the demon isn't around of its own free will and curses can be broken. Lorraine remembers that she saw something when she touched David during the exorcism and believes she connected to the person responsible for it all. But the kicker to try to access that connection again, Lorraine wants to touch Jessica. You know, the girl that's been dead at the bottom of a lake for a few months. So they break into the funeral home because that's definitely not going to result in an immediate arrest. And her body is just like, chilling up on a table. Like this is a body that spent upwards of four months, maybe more in a lake. It went through the bloating and then down to the sinking phase. It's gonna be a bit soupy. This thing would at least be in a tub and it wouldn't have been left out at night. I realize I'm looking for a little bit too much logic in a horror movie, but like still. Whatever, she grabs onto the old thing and then realizes, huh, weird. The connection isn't here. But then it is here. Like, did it bounce to a different body or did it just like bop out and then bop back in for a bit? I, I don't know. Either way, she starts mentally wandering around this spooky lair. Sees an altar, black candles, and a woman that Arnie saw earlier. So she can tell that this woman is in the process of trying to complete the curse. She starts controlling all of Arnie's actions, gets him to break the bottle of holy water. Saw that one coming. But Lorraine manages to stop her just before Arnie causes long-term damage. But now this lady also really realizes there's a connection, which means she can use it too. And the connection works both ways. And then suddenly, reanimated bloat corpse. And it's kind of scary until it runs. <laughs> I think it's funny. Ed pulls Lorraine out of the way just in time, but now that lady knows who they are, goody. She's billed as the occultist, but I just want to call her that lady. <laughs> but they get back to the house and the Warren assistant has found something. An early Renaissance book from the restricted section. And that's how you know it's legit. But it was something used to identify and persecute witchcraft. They end up finding a section about human sacrifices and one that calls for both a murder and then a suicide. And the only way to break the curse is to destroy the altar it was cast from. But then there's like another section that's in a language that none of them can translate, so they've got to go find someone who can. But the big thing is, is that if she doesn't complete the curse, the demons will take her soul instead. So Ed goes to find some information and passes out the second he stands up, and then wakes up a while later when no one's around, and then the curse lady shows up. And then the corpse bro shows up, They're like, oh my god, this thing is so dumb. So of course, he starts to attack the corpse, but then it's not the corpse, it's Lorraine. Oh no, guess who's possessed now? It's Ed Warren! So then they find the totem in some flowers that their assistant let in. Good job, dumbass. So the priest and Debbie go to watch over Arnie in the hospital while the Warrens try to figure things out. And they want to know why the situation involving Jessica was just like so much further away than everything else. Turns out she brought that totem back from college, which is actually a nice little neat triangle in the area that they currently are. And because Lorraine mentioned hearing a train when she was in one of those connections, they realized the only option is the one that crosses over a river. The river they passed to get the Father Kastner's place. Place. The place that Lorraine just happens to have gone to all by herself to ask some questions about this book. Oh no! So Ed rushes off, forgets his heart pills. But Lorraine has Kastner translate a piece of the curse that says it needs three things to complete. The child, the lover, and the man of God. So Jessica was the lover, and Ed's obviously the man of God. But the curse flipping from David to Arnie ruins the requirement for a child. So the curse is already bust, isn't it? Some people think that, like, Jessica was supposed to be the child. Like, she's a university student. Like, no, fuck you, because then David would have been the lover. He's eight. That means he's even less sense. This is stupid. Jessica is the lover and no one can argue with me because her backstory is being told in a story called The 
love her. I don't have time for this stupid. Anyways, he gets Lorraine back down to the basement and starts showing her a photo album of his child that the church couldn't know about, so he raised her in secret. He says they had fun, but I just can't imagine that being a good time. But he continued his studies into the occult so he'd be able to protect her from everything, but all he did was create a fascination of the occult within her. Then he says something that I feel should have been a larger theme in this movie, considering the Warrens have a kid and literally a museum of haunted items. We must be careful how our obsessions are passed to our children. Yeah, I want to see that story. Warren Child goes rogue. Oh, that doesn't happen in real life, you say? Well, almost none of the stuff that happens in these movies happen in real life. Obviously, Castor knew it was his daughter all along, but was hoping she'd change. So like, was he just hoping that she'd finish off this little three-piece curse and get it out of her system and then like, just not get a job as a librarian or something? But he doesn't end up pointing Lorraine in the right direction to find the altar, and then Daughter Dearest comes home. And then kills him? <laughs> Did she hear him betray her or something? I don't know. Anyways, the two end up having a nice little psychic battle where Lorraine connects into her mind so she can see that there's a rock nearby and whack the bitch. But she doesn't stay down for long. Ed gets to the scene and then they do the old Texas switch where it looks like Lorraine is running at him and then it changes to Isla at the last second who dusts him with something. So now he's back in full possessed mode and trying to kill Lorraine. And then Arnie is obviously being possessed again because this lady's soul is on the line. It's just the firing. Dude, you are out of your wheelhouse. So the demon obviously starts re-entering his soul and they're praying over his body. All the lights break, his body contorts before he starts levitating. The prison people are watching from afar. Isla getting really theatrical with this one. So Lorraine is desperately trying to get Ed to remember who she is. He's having flashbacks to their first date and then eventually manages to snap out of it and smashes the altar. So the curse breaks and so nice that their backs aren't broken after all these contortions. But she didn't even need to snap him out of it. If like he's trying to kill you with a sledgehammer, all you have to do is get to the altar and he's gonna smash it to get through it to you. And then the curse would have been broken and he would have been fine, but I guess that's not romantic. Ed had to be so strong that he could withstand the demon all on his own. So the demon now obviously takes Isla's soul instead. And I'm gonna be honest, trading three souls with the potential of losing yours if you don't complete things properly just doesn't seem like a good idea. Uh, really bad odds and stupid curse. You don't even get a wish out of it. Like literally it was just because. And aw, Lorraine had a heart pill on her just in case. So because of them adding this chalice to their collection of cursed items, showing that Lorraine has learned absolutely nothing from her experience with Kastner, you'd think after hearing about the priest's daughter who became obsessed with the occult because of all the stuff he had would just, you know, make them reconsider these things. And then we get yet another major leap outside of reality. It cuts to Arnie back in court, where instead of being sentenced to death and convicted of murder, he's convicted of manslaughter and sentenced to 10 to 20 years, of which he only serves five because of good behavior. Then he marries Debbie, and that is what really happened. But the movie implies that it was 100% because the Warrens were able to prove demonic possession. But were they? Honestly, this is stupid. It was manslaughter because they couldn't find any evidence of premeditation, and they managed to make a pretty big push for self-defense in an agitated situation. But the whole case to this day is just overpowered by the claims of the devil made me do it. Cause that's obviously way more interesting, and it definitely didn't hurt that Arnie's lawyer was absolutely sensationalizing that to the media. Just because you couldn't use it officially in the courtroom doesn't mean you can't use it in the public court. Anyways, the whole thing ends off with the Warren seemingly older and Ed surprising Lorraine with a gazebo modeled after the same one they spent their first date at. But it feels like they kind of ham-fisted all of this gazebo stuff in so that they could have some like emotional conclusion to the Warren trilogy. Like I'm sure they'll spit out another one of these at some point, but like this could just act as a closing. Then we get the end credits that have actual audio from the David Glatzel exorcism, which was a choice. I don't know, I think this had the base to be something really good, but I just didn't love it or even really enjoy it that much. <laughs> it's not terrible, but they somehow made one of the most notorious cases in American judicial history boring. And they were allowed to add as much crazy shit as they wanted. So the stuff with David is based on real events or at least real accounts. The general idea of what happens with Arnie is based on real events until it gets into the stuff with, in prison. But all the stuff with the occult and Isla and the curses and Katie and Jessica were just not real at all. Because again, by the Warren's own claims, David was being possessed by like 43 de demons and then two devils. So there was a lot more going on there than just like, this is somebody possessing someone with 
one cursed demon. But that's gonna do it for this video. If you guys watch this movie, let me know what you're thinking down below. I'm assuming people probably like this a lot more than me. I don't know why I felt this was so lackluster. Maybe if I'd seen it in a theater, it would have had a better experience, but I just didn't think it was that great, especially when comparing it to the other Conjuring movies. But thank you all so much for watching. Thanks as always to my Patreon supporters. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. Leave a like on the video if you're into that kind of thing. I hope you're all having a fantastic day. I'm mostly okay, and we'll catch you all later.